Mr. Bentley James. Yep. We're just going to have a yarn. Would you mind introducing yourself, saying who you are, a little bit of your story? In uh, so I'm a PhD in anthropology. That's linguistic anthropology and a linguist and I spent an awful lot of time sitting around doing homework late at night which I would have preferred to have been sitting around the campfire talking story and learning languages and I've uh, learned three indigenous languages from Australia. Yulungamata with the language of the North Sea Arnhem Land people where I have lived for the last 25 years in Kapuyak, Kalawinko and uh, Milingimbi and most of that time spent on homelands particularly Murunga with Laurie Bay Murwanga, the Senior Australian of the Year 2012. So uh, to cut a long story short, uh, I learned to speak Yulungamata and then Big Boss said to me, I met her, went to Murunga Island, very remote, beautiful place, and said, and she said, don't speak that language, obviously not in English, speak the language of the islands, which is yan nangu, yan, meaning tongue, nangu, meaning here, the language of here which at that time had not been recorded at all. So uh, there was only 200 words on record. So she and I spent the next 20 years going around the islands, mapping some 600 sites and all of the words associated with them, the names and the intimate linkages between site-based knowledge and ancestral essences and related songs, stories and family relations called Baparu that show people's ongoing commitment to care for the land that they inherited from the ancestors. So Big Boss and I uh, were out there doing things and I said to her in passing one day, did you know that uh, your group are uh, understood to be extinct? And she said, well that's news to me. So together we launched a case in the Land Council to have her recognised as the traditional owner of the island Gallowinkle, particularly the bit where the town site is, which came to light. Of course, uh, it was utterly correct incontrovertibly so she's the only one who knows all the names the songs the business and everything and it's hers so what could you do you know there was nobody who was going to stand up and say oh it's not so from that arrangement she was then back paid rents owing her to 1942 which amounted to a little over five hundred thousand dollars which she said look i don't want money i don't care for money at all all i want is kin and country to be looked after so she bade me go ahead with many of the projects that we had designed before to create opportunities for children and young adults to engage with country be employed in a way that would be gainful for them and interesting to them and learning and engaging with the spirit of country names of places where they were what their songs were and husbanding the land which is what people do all the time anyway so they would be paid to do that the ranger program that we developed the junior ranger program preschool language nests and some of the other projects were all about passing on that kind of information to a younger generation so intergenerational generosity was only one of the virtues that this lovely old lady had the money part of it also gave her the option of being able to produce the atlas and the atlas was something of, uh, to do with making sure that all of the children in North East Arnhem Land had the opportunity to understand precisely where they came from and what the meaning of the land and the country that they aren't able to glean from the later living relatives. So nobody else of course was born in 1917 and knew all the stories and knew all the business. She was the only one who did so she wanted them to get that stuff and not lose it obviously because it's immeasurably precious so the atlas is part of that project to uh, continue to pass on that sort of stuff that's basically what we were doing right up until the time that uh, she was recognized as the senior australian of the year and uh, she was quite chuffed about that given that she didn't speak english uh, she thought that that was nice that the white people should recognize her Actually, though, she was un... not happy about, firstly, uh, we were unable to collect funding at all from government institutions to do the language work we want because the government is not interested in continuing languages in Australia. And any sign of that would have to be in the 500,000 Indigenous people in Australia. Each of them get less than $20 per year per person for Indigenous language maintenance. The government doesn't care despite what it says. 
bilingual education and the idea that people should learn their language so then they can learn English makes perfectly good sense. It is impossible to learn a second language without a bilingual base to work from. You understand how to speak and spell in your own language and then you can grasp another one. That has been taken away from children as well with the government legislating against it because an inarticulate community of children will be much easier to jail and in the Northern Territory at the moment the jailing rate has gone up some 25% since the coming of the 2007 intervention mm. and 88% of people in jail in the Northern Territory of Indigenous descent, 99 if you're under 19. There's no way of staying out of jail. They target you, as Frank Barter from Yindamu says, DWB, don't be caught driving while black. They just throw you in jail for anything. Once you're in there, of course, it's very hard to get out of the system. And you're in the system for all kinds of reasons. For example, they will send a letter to you that says, you know, they want you to appear in court for some reason, absolutely meaningless rubbish, to a postal service that doesn't exist to a post office box that doesn't exist, to a place where there are no post boxes or postmen. So where there's a giant pile of letters on the floor in the council office, which get burnt once every month, and people are supposed to, what, by osmosis, understand that the government is dragging them into the court system? Rubbish. It's all about the settler state government and you know, the uh, colonial settler state finding ways to appropriate people's land. As for children, of course, they, as we speak, are being vacuum cleaned up by uh, the new system, which is the second round stolen generation. It's doing brilliantly well. Very, very powerful. And kids are just being sucked out of community all over the place. Don't know why I got onto that. Well, anyway, so Big Boss said what I want... Oh, yeah, sorry. It's relevant. We'll talk about it later. Right, Keep right. going. So Big Boss uh, said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to make this book for all kids in Australia. Because all children should know who and what and where they're from and what it's all about. So uh, we asked the government if we could have some backing to do this. They just said, get out of town. So uh, obviously we didn't get any backing from them. That's why Big Boss was uh, a little bit chuffed that the government actually noticed her in uh, 2012. But after the 2007 intervention, she was quite shocked. She did not recognise, she didn't know. In fact, most people in the remote areas didn't know that white people hated them so much. So they were absolutely overwhelmed. But can you imagine? being told, for example, after having survived and looked after the world for 60 to 40,000 years, that you don't know how to look after your children and that all your men are pedophiles. Mm. They're absolutely unstantiated claims. The 500-page document that was tabled in Parliament about uh, the intervention, 450 of those pages are about land reform. Well, where's the surprise? It's always been about stealing people's land. And all of this stuff is about stealing people's land. So Big Boss knew that. There isn't an Indigenous person I've ever worked with in Australia, both in the centre and the top, who doesn't instinctively know that the white man is here to steal their country. If you ask them where the people of Perth or Melbourne or Sydney are, they'll say all dead. But they don't need to tell you why, because we all know why. That's an aside. The point of the book then is to try and pass on that information and so Big Boss paid for it and for the last three years I've been travelling around North East Arnhem Land going to schools and homelands and outstations and talking to people about the book and then giving it back to them. Similarly the red book, the one on shells, Maypal, Maili Gawanga, Maypal meaning something like shellfish, meaning and place, is a book about how shellfish fill our lives, how they are related to ancestral stories, how they're part of our everyday food, and why we would go on and uh, learn all about them. So there's over 150 kinds of beautifully photographed maypole shellfish in colour photographs, which is the only, uh, what do you call it, sort of identification guide for shellfish in the top end of Australia, Queensland and Western Australia included. So uh, it's actually quite a useful guide for people who want to live in the bush 
as well as, of course, for kids. So it's in nine indigenous languages from the top end, in Nilomata. So all the Bapuru languages, Dango, Jango, Nango, Nangumi, Dual Duala, and so forth and so on. So we've made it widely understandable for all the kids. So when we handed it out, they could find their words organised into bilingual education alphabetical order. It groups the sounds in their language together in a way that's sensible to them. And it's been used you know, for the last 30 or 40 years in the bilingual education field up there. Uh, that's me. Done. <laughs> Is there anything else? I'm saving you from a little spider that decided to come say hello. Ah, oh, thank you. Love <laughs> Wowie, all right. Well, I learned in that book that there is a shellfish for, uh, that is ear medicine. Absolutely, mandapani. And I think uh, mandapani is a dango word from the Waramedi language. But what you do, you want to know what you do I, with it, don't I, you? Gosh. I didn't want to put a slug in my ear. Yeah, we don't actually <laughs> pop the ear. I think it's an echinoderm. I think it's one of the, no, I beg your pardon. What's the other things? They're like starfish. But they sort of, you know, they move by some kind of like hydraulic. An yes, that kind okay. of thing, but no hard outside. Um, maybe like a tripang or something. Like, I think holothurian. Anyway, they're, they've got a big scientific name. They obviously exist, but they're cute little things. They live in a little sort of package about that big with bumps all over the back, and you don't eat them straight off the rock like the other one that are very similar, but with the slatted backs. They have six or Bigger pardon, they have nine little platelets on their back, that's Badama, and then there's the spiky one. Uh, now his name is, uh, for the moment, can't bring it to mind. Mandapane is a little soft, sluggy looking little thing with bumps on his back that you pop into a pot with water in it, and as it boils away, the juices called wika come out of that pot and those are the ones that you pick up and put in a spoon or some sort of object that you can hold or maybe on a piece of uh, grass at the end has been worked and then you pop that in the ear of the child. Children often have inner ear and middle ear infections. So there we go, mandapati in the ear. Fascinating. <laughs> and this is important knowledge. Mm. So important, um, and so it's really inspiring to hear that you feel the the calling and the passion to assist in keeping this wisdom alive and with the people, the people who need it. I wasn't really in the position of denying uh, to do it because um, obviously, you know, somebody who is nearly a hundred years old and is incredibly sharp and beautiful as the virtuous Bhaimaruanga was hardly going to be denied and uh, she was the kind of person who said you could go over there and get me a cup of tea and you would ask how many sugars she would like in that. Mm. She was just so charming and so gracious and so generous and such a lovely energy, utterly beautiful but also very cranky. Oh dear. So, uh, you know, you couldn't bullshit up hmm. if you tried any, and, and I tried. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it, there was no way, yeah. She'd been around too long. Hmm. Um, it was difficult uh, work on occasion, but it always was rewarding to see her smile. Just such a lovely person, you couldn't help be drawn into her world and you couldn't help wanting to please her mm. so if anything the whole thing has about, been about making an old lady happy and that was the greatest joy it was utterly lovely she was really really very special there uh, are a couple of other lovely old ladies up there but um, just at the moment i need to get some more money so i can go back up there and start this next project Mm. It's all about you know, having enough funds to be able to do it. It's very unusual in Australia for you know a hundred year old indigenous lady to suddenly win half a million dollars and uh, turn it back into projects to help the community. So uh, we're just hoping uh, with our fingers crossed that the next will be coming along shortly. What is the next project? Oh, so I'm working on a, in Australian indigenous cultures, uh, there was 500 languages when white people first came to the country. About 200 or so of them still tenuously existing now. But by the end of the next 20 years or so, there'll be 10 very solidly in place. 
healing about the world was one of those. But all of them had with them an alternate sign language so that, for example, in all of the different areas in life, if you were in mortuary camp, you could sign to other people, you know, what it is you wanted. Or for kinship relations, you could call over to somebody on the other side of the fire there and, without making any noise. When you're hunting, of course, you don't make any noise while you're hunting. Uh, when you're around the fish traps, you know, the mythology of the fish traps were, means that you have to be quiet. If you're in country where there are spiritually dangerous places, you're not allowed to call out. You have to use hand signs, uh, mortuary cer ceremonies, and in ceremony, and in secret too. There are all kinds of reasons in a place where everyone lives together where there are no walls, why you might secretly want to be able to communicate with somebody. And so uh, hand signs are part of the way that Indigenous people in Australia did business all the time. But they're incredibly fragile and they disappear enormously quickly so that when children are forced into schools and uh, unfortunately the kind of schooling that they have been given is not the kind that they might do to actualize themselves and learn second language it's all about square pegs and round holes about bashing them into shape and marching them like little army kids so the non-indigenous school teachers force those children to behave as they behaved in school and therefore the kids are not allowed to sign to each other and lose much of this. Now at home around the campfire they're still capable of being able to pick that stuff up but it's more rare now. There's less opportunity to go hunting on country, there's less opportunity to go to the homelands, there's less opportunity to engage in such things because the settler state is forcing those kinds of opportunities out of people's lives. It's one of the key tools of assimilation. If people can't speak their language and communicate with each other using the language of the ancestors, then they can only use the language that we have given them and then we can control them much more easily, we being the settler state. Sign language, obviously, um, is a great way of being able to undermine all of that stuff. And, you know, you can always do a sign here behind your back that the people you want to see it see, but nobody else does. So what I've decided to do then is go back out to North East Arnhem Land and sit down with those very lovely old ladies that are around and collect as best as possible all of those signs, no secret sacred material obviously, and then put those together in a similar kind of encyclopedia style as the atlas or the book of shellfish and give those back to children on the homelands and in the ranger programs and in the school throughout northeast Arnhem land again as well but uh, it all requires you know uh, money and good fortune so uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment is keeping my fingers crossed and hoping that I can find uh, like-minded people who want to chip in to make it happen that's basically why Guy brought me down here was to share this information and see if there was anybody with any formerly large pile of money who wanted to uh, throw it at this kind of project. Uh, which we haven't found, but um, who knows, you know, the network of relationships and friendships and mm. the energy of the rainbow goes far, so we just need to give it time to see what happens. We may be lucky. And those signs still exist in the place that I'm going to, whereas so many other places they no longer do. It would be lovely to save them before they disappear completely. Mm. You're quite a rebel. Must be. <laughs> Must be. Mm. Well, not to um, big bosses authority, of course, or you know, to things that make sense and that are uh, of the right kind. But um, you know, I don't see any reason why we would submit to the idea that killing the people who own the country, destroying their language and culture, murdering the bush and everything that goes with it, so some fat cats can get incredibly wealthy and destroy everybody else, would be a good idea. It just doesn't seem to make sense to me at all. So uh, as best as possible, I want to sort of extract myself from that scenario. And what is the situation at the moment in the Northern Territory uh, regarding the homelands? So, in 1980, 
in fact in 75 in some places and for Big Boss uh, in the 1960s she was taking her family back to their country so people were re-engaging with their sites and business and spending some time there some time elsewhere which is how people did things of course they moved throughout the islands with the seasonal change of weather winds allowed them to travel and then there would be various kinds of fruits and fish and birds and reptiles and so forth that would be available for harvest. So people moved in a cycle way. That's the same all around Australia. Some places they built huts that were more permanent. Those more permanent places on very key sites in people's country were looked after so that each year when they came back again there was somewhere to stay. You could leave your canoe somewhere where it wouldn't get destroyed by the environment. That kind of thing became the homelands movement. There's a number of different explanations about how it came about. There's a couple of really good books about it as well but it was definitely and overarchingly about people's desire to continue to care for country and that is absolutely indisputable. As people did so, there was also a movement in the white Australian society around that time where, you know, you had songs like um, uh, Black Fella, White Fella, doesn't matter what your colour, George Dilanger singing away. There were people who cared about the interests that Indigenous people had, the Gove Land Right case, the 1976 uh, Land Rights Act and the high watermark in recognition of Indigenous rights. And that was a good time. Well, the powers that be, particularly the corporate ones that own the government, thought that this won't do, and they have mounted a great operation, it's been very successful, to cause the wider society, firstly, not to want to uh, recognise Indigenous rights, and to blame Indigenous people for uh, the horrible situation that the settler state has delivered to them yeah. and to very cleverly us and them then so that the poor in Australia and that's the everyday people living in the suburbs whose futures are being destroyed, whose low quality education is seen as natural and low quality of health care and in a country that is enormously wealthy and unbelievably so has been been robbed by the production of the ideology that unions are bad and that the way that you know indigenous people exist in the world are bad and the only thing to do is to be a user pays kind and work longer hours for less money in order to be able to produce some small wealth to live, consume, be silent, die. Thank you. That ideology has been very powerful and effective. As an outcome of that kind of thinking, the Homelands movement was vilified by powerful politicians. I think, for example, immediately of a lady called Amanda Vanstone, a really attractive human being, who incidentally wrote a version of the Australian anthem, her own one, and that is a musical masterpiece, let me assure you, in every way reflecting of the kind of character that she is. She called Homelands, let me see, was it some kind of... Um, I uh, can't remember the precise expression, but what it did was vilify those people living on homelands as if they were wasting other people's money, Australian people's money, and living the lives of the super rich. Well, that's clearly not the case. So, government policy has worked consistently since, and particularly through John Howard's years, to undermine funding for Indigenous people to live on their land and provide the enormous benefit they do to the wider society in coastal surveillance, in toxic weed and uh, feral animal control, for the values that that land contains in the kinds of multi-varieties of plants that exist there that are fire dependent and so the world of their country needs to be reburnt each year in the precise way that they always have so that those kinds of foods and the biodiversity of those areas remain. And of course what is probably not well recognised in Australia is that the biodiversity values in remote area Australia, particularly the Northern Territory, are absolutely pristine. 
80% of the Northern Territory is owned by Indigenous people under the ALRA Act and native title, but the ALRA Act is a powerful tool for uh, ownership. Uh, native title is a uh, misnomer, in fact, it's a kind of government tool for dispossessing people of their rights in regard to land and country. But that country is still owned by Indigenous people and they are out there trying to care for it. Their ability to be able to do so is circumvented by the government's punitive tools. Ultimately, people want to live on country and look after country, but they're being stopped from doing so. In so doing, they're robbing from all Australians the biodiversity, the looking after country, and the languages and arts and dance and culture and expressions of being in place that were developed in those countries over 40,000 years. So the longest surviving social organisation style in the world, or perhaps the universe, and this is the last, last gasp. And still the government continues to persist in breaking the homelands and keeping the people off their country. So they tied homelands life and school education to the provision of citizens' rights so that if you were a citizen of Australia, black or white, and you didn't send your school to a prescribed school of the kind that they have prescribed, then they could take your citizens' rights off you. And that meant that all the schools where homelands had been, they closed those so people had to move off those homelands to places where there were schools already. The 70 prescribed communities throughout the Northern Territory, for example, where they had already for the last 40 years been saying, what we need is housing, there's 40 people to a house, now there's 50 people to a house. Because the government has provided no more housing, despite what it says, those houses are overcrowded in the most intolerable way. And I have heard people say, oh, that's because Indigenous people like to live together. Yeah, but not in those kinds of squalid conditions. And that Indigenous people want to speak English. Yes, but not to the detriment of their own language. And those people want to don't want to uh, be part of the economic system. Sure, but not at the exclusion of their culture and their connections to land. And why shouldn't they, for all our benefits, be able to continue to live in that beautiful pattern that pre-existed? Now, let me just jump to one article that we always hear in the sort of common view, and that's the one about, well, Indigenous people, indigenous people have a problem with alcohol. And uh, I heard this one produced on a number of occasions. In the Northern Territory, the fact is, and this is written down in a piece of paper called Dispelling the Facts 1993 by Robert Tickner and to this very day it continues to be the case that Indigenous people in the Northern Territory 80% of them have not and have never tried alcohol. 80%. They live in remote areas where there is no alcohol. So apart from Alice Springs, Tennant Creek and Darwin there are no pubs in the bush except one or two, one on Tiwi Island, and I think there's one in Daly River. They are the exception. Yet, 95% of non-Indigenous people in the Northern Territory are drunkards every weekend and behave in the most unconscionable way. Isn't it lovely to hear the pot calling the kettle black? Here's the other thing about this. More one single hit broken jaws per capita in Darwin than anywhere else in the country. The place of Ted Egan's beer carton playing stupidity. We've got the great beer drinkers of the Northern Territory. And yet the Indigenous people are the ones who are blamed for the outrages of the settler state and its poor. So all of that talk about Indigenous drinking in the Northern Territory is a misnomer and should be denied with absolute derision. It's always used, isn't it, by mm -hmm. those who would seek to undermine Indigenous people. Just think what Bhaimarwanga would say. So, yep. the wanting of land, does it all come down to mining? Or what are the agendas? Good. Good question, yeah. So, 
The government exists to create the conditions for the movement of capital, despite what it says. Mm -hmm. And so you'll hear ministers and what an interesting bunch of people are. It wouldn't be lovely to just have a cup of tea with a minister. Because that's as long as you would be able to cope with their company. They are unbelievably stupid, yes. dull, but cunning, awful. Sorry. Mm -hmm. The point is that the government exists to create the conditions for the movement of capital. And those people who work in the government are getting paid very well, thank you very much. And when they leave, they still get paid by us, the poor. So they're there to pretend that that is not the case, but they are there in order to give us what we want. Government appears to do things. Oh, we're appearing to protect the country. So did we just spend $40,000 million on submarines? Gee, I knew there was something we were missing. There it is. Or was it the $60,000 million we spent on American planes for the war we've got with the mosquitoes? So they are appearing, apparently, to protect us from what precisely, I'm not sure, perhaps we need some protection from them. Mm. But at the same time, their interests are exactly aligned to those of corporations. The government of Australia is in fact a corporation and floated on the stock exchange. It works in harmony with other corporations that are creating the kinds of conditions that are allowing them to rob the resources of this and every other country for their profit and the three triple bottom line uh, rhetoric that they spiel out every now and then is nothing more than a shimmer. It's just some kind of thing they do in order to keep people from revolting. So in Australia you won't find it very difficult to meet people who will remind you that the unions are bad and that the government is doing what they can in difficult situations and that corporations are really good guys and they're doing everything they can. They provide jobs. Well, if that were the case, if they did provide jobs, then why hasn't everybody got one? Because just the profits, for example, from BHP and the $40,000 million they made last year would be enough to make every single Australian a millionaire. Oh, so where's your job story now? It's all bulldust. And the government is the tool of the corporation. So mining is very much a strong interest in Australian resource stealing, absolutely. But there's other ones too. And when it came to the intervention in 2007, mm -hmm. um, from my memory, it followed on from a report called Ch Little Children a Sacred Report. Yep. Yep. Um, which was used by, you know, went viral in the media and yep. used um, to send the army into the Northern Territory with, with doctors and where children were forcefully go, um, put through physical examination. Mm. Um, where, of course, a lot of people were grabbing their kids and running bush, so, you know, knowing yes. what the hell's going to happen. Yes. And to my understanding, while there was, you know, the, the general mainstream society got behind this because the government is making, you know, all of these poor Indigenous children safe from, you know, this this alleged pedophilia which is reaping through their, their communities. To my understanding, nobody was actually charged. A couple of white men, in couple fact. A couple of white men, yeah, okay. After spending $200 million in the investigation. And yet the land rights were taken away from the people? Absolutely. Yeah. Immediately, um, the planes started searching the areas for resources pretty immediately and it was a fantastic tool hmm. um, that was used. Trojan horse, absolutely, par excellence. John Howard rode into Aboriginal Australia on the backs of damaged children. And uh, that vile little man and his institutions all went out there precisely to do pre just what you said, to steal the resources of those people, as best as possible to divide and conquer. And they did that beautifully by running a media campaign that captured the imagination of all people in Australia. Little children are being raped by murderous men. Yeah. It's a powerful tool. The fact is, they are, by white men and the institutions of the settler state 
and it's colonialism. There's no doubt about it. And they are being taken out of their families and driven into homes in various places around Australia where absolutely terrifying stories are coming out. But I think to stick to the main thrust of the intervention time, all of those nurses whom I had known and had lived out there in remote area communities knew all about the kinds of illnesses that those children had and those illnesses were all to do with not having enough places to sleep, not enough food, not enough housing, all of the kinds of ongoing problems that people had been complaining about for the last 40 years and begging for houses. And the reason that they hadn't been fixed over the last 40 years is because the government fails to provide backup services for the hospital and also remote area clinics so that those ongoing treatments that are needed could happen. It's the government's fault and the government has failed to provide those services. So all it discovered was precisely what it already knew and had known incidentally for 30 years because there'd been five or six different inquiries of the size of the little children are sacred that had been tabled in government. They knew it, they knew it, and they still didn't do anything about it. And you know what? They still didn't do anything about it this time. All those kids are still sick. All of those conditions still exist. They don't care. It was all about land grab. And that was obvious. However, the media in Australia, obviously, like all over the world, is run by the same corporations that are in league with the mining companies and those other corporations. They're all on the same page. So that, continuing to propagate the story that Indigenous people are undeserving and evil and all of the other things that we can say about them in the newspaper and get away with, help the conscience of those white people who fail to recognise that it is their voting and their society and their links to the state-sponsored colonial project that are perpetrating and continuing the behaviour in the government. If every Australian person, that's the 20 million Australian people, stood up and said, that's enough of that, then it would be over. But they're too well fed. Everybody wants to get their motor car and their this, that holiday and fly to Bali and doesn't care about the plight of Indigenous people. They're doing very well, thank you very much, by continuing to steal their land and dispossess them. There has been many examples of state sponsored colonial settler environments where you get Americans, firstly English settlers, going to the American continent, putting out banners that say, we've got an Indian person with a banner that says, you know, come to our country and help us. And so the settlers go to the country and they help indigenous people. Well, help them what? The indigenous people? The settlers know precisely what they're doing. They're going there to take the land of those people and steal their resources. The only way they can make themselves feel good about it is by pretending that it's the fault of the indigenous people. We did everything we can to help them. We can be completely exonerated for our evil acts and violence against them. And violence in our names, obviously. Uh, people at home don't go out and kill Aboriginal people. The people at home don't support the stolen generation. But people at home don't stand up and do anything about it either. So Passive support. Absolutely. Powerful tool. Really good. And the government's got that one tied because its friend, the media, is a corporation just like it and its interest is creating the conditions for the movement of capital. Mm. So if people don't make themselves aware, they can't really claim ignorance. It's just not good enough. So, then we have powerful, amazing people like Big Boss, rare gems and treasures. Mm. Are there still tribal elders, true tribal elders, wisdom keepers, those who keep the torch alight for us? Moving forward, what hope is there? I myself am completely and utterly optimistic about the future. Now, I know that that sounds a bit funny given that um, there's a underlying uh, expectation that's all going to go to pot. But I do have optimism for this aspect, that it will destroy itself with such utter and calamitous horribleness that the system is so grotesquely misshapen that it will fall over itself and 
break up. So I'm hoping that that'll happen soon. I know that's going to be a painful thing, mm -hmm. but there are people out there who do have this knowledge, who are wonderful and are trying to keep these things alive. They're brave and hardworking and, and enormously noble people, and they're trying to keep this stuff alive for the future. What's your advice, Bentley? I know there are a lot of, uh, you know, people who might start waking up or, you know, whose hearts might start leading them to wanting and genuinely, um, not in a wanting to save kind of, you know, idealism, but genuinely wanting to support um, and to do what they can for the Indigenous people of Australia, this, this amazing, um, wise, knowledgeable, grandparent consciousness that is there that we can learn so much from. What do you recommend people can do because it can become a bit of a... Uh, people can get lost in their attempts and give up quite easily is something that I've observed. What's your recommendation for people? Well, firstly, uh, as a sort of humorous aside, we never give as generously as when we give advice, so uh, <laughs> look out. Uh, the advice that I take is that of Noam Chomsky. For me, he just seems to be the smartest guy around. And he says, keep talking to each other, keep working. These things have always been done by group actions. People, brave, brave people who continue to fight on singularly with no resources, talking, helping each other, community, staying together, working together, keep talking to each other, organise, 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 organise. That's the only thing that works. And that was the thing that worked in the 1970s that brought to light uh, the how terrible it was that the Gove dispute was destroying people's land and not even telling them that they were going to rob their resources and brought to light all of the other misshapen relationships to Indigenous society in this country. Talking, going to meetings, organising, Talking together, organising, that's it, that's the only one now. That's not my idea, of course, I stole that off Noam Chomsky, but uh, if you want a good idea, he's the guy who's got them. Keep so. it simple, get involved. Yeah, get in, absolutely, absolutely, yep, for sure. Yep, that's the only thing that I can do, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, unless you have to be uh, Bill Gates, it's uh, us against the world. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now, one thing I'd like to say is, from what I've noticed, you're an incredibly humble man um, who, you know, if, if what I've noticed is correct, um, can shy away from the limelight and can definitely, um, definitely put into the limelight the amazing contributions of you know, the heroes of the world like Big Boss, but don't necessarily see people's attraction to you and um, maybe that you're not quite aware of how fascinated people are with you and your amazing life of service and the example I don't want to be in the limelight I know you don't want to be in the limelight <laughs> but do you, much nicer but people do to look you at. realize what it is that people are actually drawn to it's the idea of being a service to the world, yeah. you know, the idea of uh, that kind of generosity. That is the virtue that Big Boss gave, and that is what I wanted to emulate. You know, I can't help it. You You've know, done you an exceptional job, oh. and it's fascinating. It's like, uh, you know, you as a human being, you're absolutely gorgeous, and I love spending time with you. But there is something that I feel like I'm learning from being in your presence, which is more of a, a blueprint that you carry, a story that you carry that can be shared um, energetically, or I'm not sure how, but of this very real life living example of what it looks like to be of service. Thank you. It's very nice. It's That's a very, very nice. Fascinating. That's, yes, absolutely lovely. Uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, cut, Thank you. Cut. <laughs> He's really lashing on you, would. <laughs> no, but it's 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 true, it's true. And my only thing that I could pass on is that I hope um, I know you don't like being having attention on you, but um, to give people the opportunity to just drink of you for a moment because they're getting something from you that's a little bit 
deeper, that is a gift that you share without even being aware that you share it. It, goes, it surpasses your knowledge, your wisdom, your life, the um, successes, all of that. Wow. Um, it's something much deeper and it's very beautiful. I'm going to get a bit of me. I sound great. Yeah. <laughs> Have there a cup is, worth. <laughs> yes, yes. There are other people out there who uh, who really, really do have uh, fantastic stories. And uh, I suggest that um, we focus on them. And invariably those people are not interested in sort of attracting attention. They want to focus on the stories. And mm. so I suppose... Uh, it's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's something that I find valuable too, is to focus on the story. Um, I've got a blog online, it's called The Value of Cultural Difference, and some of the stuff that I've been working on that's not directly related to Big Boss but comes out of that sort of work uh, is available, so if you just put in my name and, uh, anyway, just my name or Big Boss or Crocodile Islands Rangers or anything like that, it'll come up and you can have a look at the other silly business that I've been looking at and if there's anything that's interesting or inspiring in there, uh, contact me through that and uh, no I'll talk to you for sure. <laughs>